Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for this week's video lecture. Today we're looking at Strayer's Chapter 19, Empires in Collision, Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia, 1800 to 1914. This is the fourth and final chapter in the modern unit. Um, this is also, fortunately, the shortest. And in this chapter, uh, Strayer is going to look at uh, three different societies who come into direct conflict with the West and look at the very different ways that they respond to those uh, challenges. The first of these is China. In 1750, China was still a global superpower that dominated world trade. In 1793, however, Emperor Qian Long made a fateful decision to deny Britain's request to loosen trade restrictions. Thus began what the Chinese still refer to as a century of humiliation that culminated with the end of the dynastic cycle that formed the basis for imperial China for thousands of years. So what led to this dramatic reversal of fortune? To a large degree, China can be seen as a victim of its own success. Indeed, the Qing dynasty in some ways can be seen as exceeding the limits of what a pre-industrial civilization can support. Thanks to its economic success and the increasing agricultural output from New World crops, China's population shot up from 100 million in 1685 to 430 million in 1853. This success created a looming environmental problem as China began to run out of exploitable resources. Its expansion in the West did not give it rich new world, the rich New World windfall that Europeans enjoyed. Thus, poverty, unemployment, and other social ills began to grow. Imperial China's once efficient bureaucracy did not grow to meet the demands of a larger population. Indeed, it weakened as provincial leaders began to exercise more power and authority at the expense of the central state. Soon, it failed to properly collect taxes and keep up public works such as river controls and granaries. That the Qing dynasty was Manchu and not ethnically Chinese did not help matters with many Chinese patriots. A number of rebellions erupted in the 19th century, but the largest by far was the Taiping Revolt. Its leader, Hong Zhuquan, rejected all traditional Chinese belief systems and claimed he was the younger son of Jesus Christ sent to earth to build a kingdom of heavenly peace. This radical movement attacked traditional systems of property ownership and patriarchy. As the central state failed to crush the revolt, the, principal gen the provincial gentry had to step in and put it down, reaffirming the weakness of the Qing dynasty. The provincial gentry moved against the Taiping out of fear of the movement's radical social agenda. In the post-Taiping era, the newly empowered gentry class worked with imperial authorities to impose a very conservative reaction. This delayed any serious effort at social reforms until the rise of the communists in the 1920s. The internal crisis was exacerbated by one of the most unusual examples of economic imperialism in all of world history. Having been shut out of Chinese markets by Qin Long, the British adopted a strategy of state-sponsored drug pushing and narco-trafficking unlike anything seen before or since. Due to the dramatic increase of British opium sales in China, from 1,150 pound chests in 1773 to 23,000 chests in 1832, the Chinese government tried to take a firm hand against this illegal trade that was creating many addicts and draining China of its silver supply. The incorruptible Commissioner Lin was sent to South China to stop the trade. He seized the property of the foreign drug smugglers, most of whom were wealthy and, and established trading firms, and destroyed numerous chests of the drug. In response to the perceived outrage of having British property seized and citizens held, the government sent a fleet to punish the Chinese. Thanks to their newly industrialized navy, the British were able to achieve a number of victories and dictated the terms of the peace treaty. The first of the unequal treaties, the Treaty of Nanking in 1842, opened up specific Chinese ports to British merchants and restricted Chinese sovereignty. Other countries followed with their own unequal treaties. The Second Opium War of 1856 to 1858 
saw the British vandalizing and looting the Summer Palace near Beijing and other in indignities. The war was followed with more unequal treaties and the subsequent imposition of what were called spheres of influ influence, territories that were controlled but not colonized by Britain, France, Germany, Russia, and Japan. The image at the beginning of the chapter depicts the creation of these spheres of influence. By the end of the 19th century, the once powerful Middle Kingdom, the thinking of themselves as the center of the world, found itself in a state of informal empire, losing much of its sovereignty to Europeans, Americans, and Japanese. At just the moment when a strong central authority was needed to deal with modernization and industrialization, the Qing dynasty was essentially rendered powerless. In this map, you can see uh, in the top left a uh, series of rebellions. Um, the Taiping um, is right here. This is one of the largest in uh, all of world history. The Boxer Rebellion, later on we'll talk about, is up here further in the north. The Nian Rebellion is ta it's taking place about the same time. That, that one doesn't really have any particular uh, strategy. They're just uh, rebelling against the... Um, Qing Dynasty in general. In the larger map, though, you see the creation of the spheres of influence. And if you notice where certain countries got uh, territory, there's a relationship. So, for example, um, just north of French Indochina is the sphere of influ influence for the French, the British going right through the heart, but also over here in between British India and Burma. The Germans get a little slice of the pie. Uh, notice that um, the Japanese are in charge of Manchuria. The Russians in the northern part of Manchuria is also worth pointing out. This is where the uh, Qing dynasty leaders originally came from. The Manchuria region was the, the homeland of the Qing dynasty and is now uh, controlled by two foreign powers. Despite this powerlessness, the Qing did try to do what it could to help China modernize. In the end, however, it was too little too late. Beginning in the 1860s and 1870s, a widespread movement sought to reform and rebuild China using the application of traditional principles and very limited borrowing of Western ideas and practices. Instead, the government looked for good men to rebuild the country's infrastructure, improve the examination system, and establish new industries, especially in military armaments. Unfortunately for the cause of reform, the landowners of the gentry class feared the changes posed by new industries and other forms of commercial modernity. To make matters worse, because most modern industries were in the hands of foreign experts such as engineers and managers, Many Chinese inherently distrusted efforts to expand industrial production. The failure of the modernization movement was seen in the anti-foreign traditionalist movement known as the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists. These boxers slaughtered European and Chinese Christians and laid siege to foreign embassies. A multinational force invaded Northern China crushing the movement and exacting more humiliations as revenge. Faced with a foreign dynasty unable to reform the empire, intellectuals formed numerous popular groups that called for a truly unified nation in which more people could participate in public life. The nationalists were opposed to both the Qing dynasty and to foreign presence, and they called for reforms in many traditional practices. A new role for Chinese women was the subject of much debate. While the Qing dynasty did try to renovate the imperial system with a program called the Hundred Days Reform in 1898, it was stopped by conservative elements of the government who could not see the writing on the wall. With dwindling support from most sectors of society and with a bureaucracy unable to face the growing challenges, the 2,000-year-old imperial system collapsed from within in 1911. Like Imperial China, the Ottoman Empire had once been a global superpower. By the 20th century, however, it was on the brink of disintegration. Indeed, the Ottoman Empire was known as the sick man of Europe by 1900. At the start of the modern era, however, things looked very differently. 
up until the 17th century, excuse me, up until the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was the great power of the Islamic world. After a series of military successes against Europe in the early modern period, many around the world viewed it as the great defender of Islam. Europeans treated the empire with awe and respect, yet this all changed in the 19th century as the Ottomans faced a world changed by Western industrialization. After the French invasion of Egypt in 1798 and its subsequent de facto independence, various European powers began to chip off more and more territory. What's more, in their weakened state, the empire that had once been a defender of the faith was unable to challenge Christian states seizing control over Muslim communities from Indonesia to West Africa. The once famed fighting force, the Janissaries, had lost their edge and become a conservative force against change in the empire. The Ottoman Empire also had an increasingly difficult economic situation. European shipping in the Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Oceans decreased the flow of trade through the Persian Gulf, Red Sea, and other Ottoman trade routes. With European industrialization, the Ottoman economy found it increasingly difficult to compete with cheaper manufactured imports. These factors hurt their tax base and led to the state taking out loans it could not afford to pay back. Foreigners stepped in and took over sections of the economy, just as the British had done in Egypt. This map, you can see the loss of Ottoman territory. The red line is the uh, boundary in 1800. Um, again, it's, it's almost as large as uh, the earlier Roman Empire from the classical era. The green part is where it is, though, by the start of World War I. And you can see the um, successive sort of chipping off of territory and general shrinkage of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans were aware of the need to modernize, and several attempts were made. In the late 18th century, after several humilia humiliating military defeats, Sultan Selim III began to use Western military advisors. However, religious leaders and the elite Janissaries argued against this European intrusion into an essential Ottoman center of power. In 1807, the Sultan was overthrown and replaced by a more conservative leader. But starting in 1839, the Ottoman state engaged in widespread reform that was really defensive modernization. Defensive meaning in defense, not in the field of defense. So it's not military modernization, but uh, defending yourself by trying to modernize. Importantly, the Ottoman leadership established religious tolerance and legal equality for all, leading to the promotion of various Christians to high office. The reforms pursued a Western form of modernity using law codes and court systems from Europe, as well as building a technological infrastructure. The reforms also opened the door for women to gain greater access to public life. The young Ottomans favored a more democratic style of rule with the constitution, with the goal of saving their Islamic community from European threats. They embraced Western technology and science, but rejected Western materialism. In 1876, they had a brief victory as the new sultan, Abd al-Hamid, accepted an elected parliament and constitution, but soon faced pressure from Russia and returned to despotic rule for three decades. Frustrated with a renewed despotism, military and civilian elites formed a movement known as the Young Turks. These were secular modernizers, and they seized power in a military coup in 1908, pushing the empire towards an unapologetically European path to modernity. The Young Turks established a radical secularization policy for schools, courts, and law codes. They also up opened up schools for women and made divorce easier. Women were also allowed to wear Western dress, and polygamy was restricted. The Turkish nationalism of the movement did antagonize non-Turks, such as Arabs and Armenians. The Young Turk movement set in motion the key principles for the post-World War I Turkish Republic. Let's take a moment to compare and contrast the outcomes of the attempts to modernize in both China and in the Ottoman Empire. Several similarities are immediately apparent. 
In the space of a century, these two great empires were brought low by the forces of the industrialized West. While both pursued policies of defensive modernization, neither achieved a complete industrial transformation. Both societies saw the spread of nationalism as a motivating ideology with broad popular appeal. But there is one big difference. While both empires collapsed in the early 20th century, China plunged into decades of revolutionary chaos until the communist victory in 1949, which brought more chaos from 1958 to 1976. But after World War I, the newly formed Turkish Republic enjoyed remarkable stability. Like China and the Ottoman Empire, Japan too was faced with a challenge from the West. Unlike the other two, however, Japan's modernization was largely successful. What explains this dramatic difference? To begin to answer that question, we must go back to the early modern period. After the devastating civil wars of the 16th century, the Tokugawa system established two and a half centuries of peace. <clears throat> Since the post-classical era, the emperor had been relegated to a symbolic role in his palace in Kyoto. The real power lay in the hands of the hereditary military dictor, dictator, the shogun, from the Tokugawa family who ruled from Edo, or present-day Tokyo. You may recall from the last unit test the, the ten measures that Tokugawa Ieyasu took to control the daimyo and the samurai. While the country was pacified, it was not unified. The system put an end to the previous civil wars and bloodshed by breaking the daimyo and forbidding the samurai to fight. It also tried to freeze Japanese society by making all professions hereditary and establishing clear laws on dress and social status. This prolonged peace allowed the Japanese economy to flourish, resulting in increased urbanization within, with Edo reaching one million, the spread of a dynamic commercial sector, and widespread literacy. But the era was not without its conflicts. Foremost were tensions between the samurai and the merchants. While the warriors were hereditary elite, there were no wars to fight, so they became bureaucrats and accountants for their daimyo, daimyo lords. They held high social status, but had little wealth and no way to prove their value. Merchants, on the other hand, vilified in the, China, in the Japanese variant of Confucianism, were increasingly wealthy and often loaned money to their local superiors. As wealth spread throughout the society, some lower status peasants began to be able to afford the trappings that had once been the realm of the elite. Widespread corruption and the failure of the government to respond to a major famine in the 1830s encouraged various revolts and uprisings, including an attack on merchants and the burning of Osaka in 1837. In the context of this social instability, a new military threat provoked a dynamic response from Japan. As the, <clears throat> excuse me, as the earlier spread of Christianity and Western weapons such as guns in the 1500s, the Tokugawa leadership decided to close their ports to the west. Only the Dutch were allowed to visit a small port island in the south once a year. In the 1800s, as American merchants and whalers began to sail in the Pacific, the Japanese imprisoned or executed any sailors who came ashore either on purpose or via shipwreck. The United States of America decided it was going to open Japan by sending a Commodore with a fleet of coal-burning ships to Tokyo Bay. He gave an ultimatum and a white surrender flag to the Japanese leaders. Aware of what the British had done in China, the Japanese capitulated and let the Westerners into the islands. Caving into the Westerners angered many, leading to civil war. In the end, a faction of younger samurai from the south came to power, removed the shogun, and returned power to the 15-year-old Maiji Emperor. Then they embarked on a course of modernization, including legal reform, industrialization, and other profound changes. Japan's quest to modernize had several distinct advantageous conditions. The Meiji Restoration wiped the slate clean without massive destruction or violence. 
The Europeans were not as interested in Japan as they were in China. Japan was not as strategically significant as the Ottoman Empire, and the United States of America was preoccupied with the Civil War and its aftermath. While these advantages certainly contributed to the success of the Meiji Restoration in propelling Japanese modernism, modernization, it is also the case that the policies themselves were very successful. Let's take a closer look at some of these policies. While Japanese modernization was a defensive program designed to stave off Western penetration, the changes were truly revolutionary and dramatically remade Japan in the space of a generation. Importantly, the Meiji reforms created a coherent and centralized Japanese state out of the feudal regionalism of the Tokugawa shogunate. The first task was to dismantle the old Confucian Tokugawa era social order. The daimyo lords were placed with authorities from the centralized state and the samurai class was disbanded. The warriors lost their special privileges and social prestige, including the exclusive right to wear their swords. Indeed, all Japanese became commoners, equal citizens before the emperor. That said, most elite Japanese found prestigious jobs in the new national military or growing government sector. After an initial period of wholesale adoption of things Western, the Japanese began to select certain aspects of the West and fuse them with various cultural traditions. The Meiji Constitution, for example, was modeled on the German Constitution, but stated that it was a gift from the emperor who descended from the sun goddess. goddess. The universal education system blended Western science with Confucian ideology. At the center of the Meiji rest modernization was a state-guided industrialization program. To speed up the process and to promote large-scale industry, the government favored the formation of large industrial combines called zaibatsu. In the space of a generation, the Japanese reform program radically transformed Japan into a modern industrial society. While the Meiji Restoration opened up some new possibilities for women, and there were a few figures who began to explore a feminist alternative for Japan. The state was largely unwilling to give women many political rights and banned them from joining political parties until the 1920s. While the Japanese industrialization process was quick and rather successful, it did create tremendous suffering at the lower end of the social strata. Peasants found life increasingly difficult and often sold their daughters to support themselves. Many of these girls went into the textile industry where they worked long hours for low wages and lived in unpleasant factory dormitories. In opposition to this new industrial social order, radical leftists began to flirt with socialism and anarchism. As a result of this dynamic modernization, Japan was able to take a seat at the table of the global superpowers by the end of the 19th century. This was the first of a series of revisions of unequal treaties, indicating that Japan was now to be treated as a sovereign and modern nation. This signaled the diplomatic victory of the Meiji era. Wars with China in 1894-95 and Russia in 1904-05 showed that Japan was now a modern military power. Its defeat of Russia was noteworthy as the first defeat of a major European power in the recent era of, of imperialism. Thanks to its victories in these wars, Japan engaged in its own empire building in Taiwan, Korea, and Manchuria. Admiration from the colonial world while those colonized by Japan, excuse me, while those colonized by Japan might disagree, many people from Poland to Ake and the Dutch East Indies looked to Japan with hope and inspiration. Japan became a symbol of standing up to the West. In this map, you get a closer look of the Japanese expansion. Um, notice taking Taiwan down here after sort of island hopping, if you will, in uh, Ryukyu. Uh, then taking Korea. Uh, which had always had some sort of relationship with China, either directly co uh, controlled or indirectly as a tributary state, and then 
um, having the influence in uh, Manchuria as the official sphere of influence. And then if you remember, this island up here is a source of dispute with them and Russia. And if you look at it, there it's not hard to see why their expansion is creating conflict with China and Russia. Um, but again, it's a testament to their success modernizing that they're able to defeat both of those rather large empires in order to expand their territory. I want to thank you for joining me for this uh, outline. I also want to apologize. I am about to lose my voice, and I'm sure I sound uh, rather raspy. Um, it's a little bit difficult for me to talk, but um, I appreciate your hanging with me, and I hope you were able to fill out the outline. I'll look forward to seeing you in class. Thanks.